everyone? Can everyone hear me at the back? I, I'm usually told I have a loud voice, so I don't usually need a mic, but I'm hoping you can all hear me. Right there as well. Okay, so my name is Zinia Chopra. I had this program called Access Chip. I'm actually the founder of this program. Um, and before I go in details and start talking about the nitty gritty of it, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about myself. So like you guys, uh, 11 years ago I moved from India to England uh, as an international student. I studied in London and then soon I realized all the problems that exist with the visa status and applying for visas and sponsorships. So, so I'm very passionate about what I do. Uh, I've set up this business. Uh, it's, we work for a charity. We're a not-for-profit organization and we sponsor about 500 international students each year help them stay in the UK for as little as three months and a maximum of 12 to 24 months. So those of you who are looking to stay here in the UK and undertake any inter internships or work experience program, this is something that hopefully you'll enjoy listening to. Um, before I start the presentation, I want to touch a little bit about tier five, differences between tier five and tier two. Uh, but I'm going to start by asking you a couple of questions and just raise your hands. It sort of gives me an idea or to understand what your intentions are and what you're looking to do after you finish your education. Um, so how many of you have heard of Tier 2? I guess it was just brought up, so you've all heard about Tier 2. And can anyone tell me just in maybe a couple of uh, sentences what they know, anyone? So many people raise their hands, come on. <laughs> Someone? Anyone? I think tier two is all about uh, working visa when you get an employer that's willing to sponsor you. When the employer is willing to sponsor you, that's correct. Somebody else raised their hand over there. Yes. So tier two visa is a working visa, mm -hmm. um, and um, you have to apply for it if the company is ready to sponsor you. If it has a special license to sponsor. You. That's correct. Yeah. Um, well then. Obviously, there are a lot of rules and regulations yeah. that prevent you from doing it. Yeah. Like you have to um, earn a special amount of money. The minimum is 2,000, uh, 20,800 pounds. Yeah, that's got uh, it. Yeah. yeah. But then, um, like according to uh, what kind of level of education you have, either master's or PhD, yeah. uh, your salary should be um, more than. Absolutely. Right. Well, very impressed with your knowledge. So well done. Um, okay. So what, the reason I asked you a little bit about tier two because I want to find out what, what you guys really want to do. So just raise your hands. So how many of you want to stay here in the UK for maybe up to two years after you finish your education? Okay, and after two years, maybe you'd want to go somewhere else or? Yeah, okay. And how many of you plan to stay here for longer than two years? Oh, just a few. Well, then tier five is the answer to all your prayers. Uh, because tier five government authorized exchange visa allows you to stay in the UK for up to 24 months from when you finish your education. Uh, the reason I want to talk a little bit about tier two and tier five because I want to sort of highlight what the differences are between the two, two schemes. So tier two is used for permanent positions only. Positions that are ongoing and they're required for a business to be able to sustain themselves. Whereas tier five, government authorized exchange visa, is for positions that are temporary. So by temporary, what I don't mean is that they're not full time or part time or anything like that. They, by temporary, I mean positions that are only offered for a certain period of time. And they're offered into, so they could be a work experience program, perhaps a placement or an internship, but they cannot be a permanent position. So that's a stark difference between tier five and tier two. Also, with Tier 2, you can only work for an employer who has the sponsorship license. Do you know what a sponsorship license means? Yes? yes? No? Does anyone want me to explain? Yes. Okay. So, a sponsorship license, in order for an employer to hire a foreign migrant worker, they have to have this license. They can get this license from home office. It's not easy to get. It can take up to six months. It also involves uh, an investment of maybe about five to seven thousand pounds. Uh, depending on the size of the organization. Um, so it does involve a little bit of work from the employer side. So there must be in that sort of financial capacity and also in a position to offer you this permanent position. But the beauty about tier five is that you can approach any employer irrespective of their size, irrespective of whether they have a sponsorship license or not. But with tier two, you're only restricted to applying for positions with employers 
who have this license. Now, those of you who maybe want to go and work for startups and SMEs, it's you know they probably don't have a tier two license. And with all the hoopla around immigration and the, the criticism and all the negative comments and all of that going on, I don't think employers are very keen on offering permanent positions and going ahead and applying for a tier two sponsorship license. Well, some of the, they don't really know you. So to invest in someone that they don't know or for an indefinite period of time, which costs between five to seven grand, it's questionable, especially for a startup, they may not have that kind of resources. So tier five, the way it helps you is, like I said, you don't have to find an employer who has a sponsorship license. You can go and work with any employer as long as they're offering you a temporary position, which is like an internship or a placement or a work experience program. The other difference as well with salaries, there's no um, well, with tier two, you have to have a minimum salary threshold. So it's moved up to 25,000 and for fresh workers and for experienced workers, it went up to 30,000 as of yesterday. Um, and as the lady over here pointed out, the higher the role, the more salary needs to be paid under tier two. So sometimes you might find an employer that's willing to offer you a permanent position. They also have a sponsorship license but they're not in the capacity to pay you what the required threshold is under tier two. So despite having all of that, you may not get the sponsorship from them. But with tier five, if you're not working in London, the national minimum wage will suffice. But if you're working in London, 15,000 15, per annum, is that's what's the minimum salary requirement. There is no upper limit threshold with tier five. We have interns that we sponsor who are earning up to 70, 80,000 per year. And these are fresh graduate recruits within engineering firms working in Glasgow. Um, so that's a big advantage. Also, another difference between tier two and tier five is the NDQ level. Do you guys understand what NDQ level is? Okay, so NDQ stands for National Vocational Qualification. Um, each job, each position which is within the labor market has some sort of skill attached to it, right? So let's say uh, I'm a bartender and you are an engineer. Which position is more skilled? Engineer, because she needs to study more for it, and she it's, it's you know she has to be working in a specific field, you know. Whereas uh, I think anyone can become a bartender. Not that I'm not saying that you know the skill level that you require for a bartender will be relatively low compared to that of an engineer. So uh, you know, for tier two, you need to have been offered a position which is NBQ level six. Whereas for tier five, the position can be as low as NBQ level three. So that's another difference. Now, if you want to go and find out what position is what NBQ level, you can Google SOC codes, Sierra Oscar Charlie, SOC codes, and that, that's a comprehensive list of all the positions that exist within the labor market, and you can check what the associated salary is for that position under tier two, and also the NBQ level. So shout out some positions that you guys are probably looking at uh, applying for. Supply chain manager. IT manager? Supply chain manager. Supply is usually NVQ level four. What are engineering? Engineering is six. Research assistant. Sorry? Research assistant. I think that would be four as well. Not 100% sure, but you'll have to check on that. So IT, sales, business development, marketing, these are NVQ level four positions. So anything that's NVQ level three and above, under tier five, you'll be able to apply for that position. So these are some of the stock differences between tier two and tier five. The reason I think tier five is really suitable um, for international students because it's a great opportunity. Sorry, shh, can I have no talking, please? Thank you. Um, so tier five, as I said, you need to, I lost my chain of thought. Um, it's a great opportunity for you guys because it's a time where you can really prove yourself, your worth to your employer. So even if they don't have the sponsorship license, they will go ahead and want to retain you. Trust me, as an employer myself, it's very hard to find hardworking, good candidates. And if you do find one, you don't want to let go of them. When you become managers, you will realize this as well. So you want hardworking staff uh, and staff that you want to invest in. So tier five is the way where you can prove your worth to your employers. And if you do do that, I'm certain, I'm certain that they will want to offer you a permanent position. Um, I'll give you an example. So have you all heard of Madame Tussauds? 
Yes, okay. So Man of Tussauds is owned by Merlin Entertainment, which is the parent company, and they have London Eye, Thorpe Park, Madame Tussauds, so they're a big company. Now they have a tier two sponsorship license themselves. In 2014, they identified a Korean national who was studying sculpting at the Royal College of Art. Now, they wanted to offer her a, an internship uh, as a sculptor. But despite being a sponsor themselves, uh, they didn't offer her the permanent position. So she came to us, we offered her a sponsorship for 12 months initially. After 12 months, the employer wanted to retain her for additional six months, which we sponsored her again for additional six months. Today, it's been, what, uh, three years? She is now under tier two, working as a senior sculptor at Madame Tussauds. There are hundreds of students that go through the same process each year. They make a name for themselves with the employer, um, and the employers then want to retain them. There is a, another candidate called Kate Andrews. Uh, she was on BBC Question Time last week. Uh, she worked for the Adam Smith Institute as a communications intern for two years. After two years, she, was, she applied for a position at the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is a very big think tank in London, and is now a communications manager over there, talking, going on Sky News, BBC News, making us very, very proud. But the reason she was able to do this is because she worked at ASI, which works very closely with the IEA, and she made a name for herself within the, within the think tank world and is now doing exceptionally well. So if you guys are looking to stay here indefinitely or for a long period of time um, and are struggling to find a tier two employer initially, I would really, really suggest that you start off by finding an internship and then we can see, uh, we can initially sponsor you for 12 months. That can be extended for another 12 months and then hopefully in two years time, your employer will want to retain you. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm going to start my presentation now. What I like to do is take questions while I am delivering the presentation. I'll, of course, address any questions towards the end of the session as well. But there are very technical words within, uh, well, it's immigration, so of course there's going to be technical words. So feel free to raise your hand, uh, and when I'm done speaking about my point, I will elaborate or answer any questions. Any questions so far? Yes. Um, what if, um, after two years, yeah. um, Well, then the employer will have to offer you a position that is NVQ level 6. They, if they want to apply in the tier 2, then they have to meet the tier 2 requirements. Okay. Anything else? Yes. So for the sponsorship, like, um, a couple of students, including myself, are like, sponsored by their governments mm -hmm. to stay. And whether we need to stay, I think there's a new regulation about having a letter because from the sponsor saying they allow us to stay. Or if we've been spending 12 months without being financially supported by the international bodies. Okay. Well, this is the same also applied to the tire fine. No, it's different. So I'll go through the eligibility criteria right. in the coming up slides. Anything about what I've talked about so far? Any questions on that? Um, yes? Do you want to charge for your services? I will cover that. Yes, we do. But you don't have to pay for that. Um, anything else? Okay, then I will start my presentation. So tier five, in 2008, when the points-based system was introduced, there were five tiers created, tier one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, tier three doesn't exist uh, because it was never opened up. Tier four is what you guys are on, student visa, so that's tier four. And the category that I'm talking about is tier five GAE. Now tier five has five subcategories. The one relevant to you, the one I'm talking about, is government authorized exchange. Tier 5 has the Tier 5 Youth Mobility Scheme. If, are there any Commonwealth uh, nationals here? They probably have heard of uh, Tier 5 Youth Mobility Scheme, okay? Then there's Tier 5 Creative and Sporting. There's Tier 5 for Religious Workers. And there's also the Research. But the one which is relevant to you that I'm talking about is GAE. So don't get confused between other Tier 5 routes. So this is GAE, Government Authorized Exchange. Now, Tier 5 Government Authorized Exchange was set up in 2008 for individuals who want to come to the UK or who are here studying in the UK. 
to undertake work experience or placement positions with UK-based employers. This program is designed specifically to allow graduates and postgraduates outside from outside of the EEA to undertake work experience programs for as little as four weeks at a maximum of 12 to 24 months. Now when I say 12 to 24 months, it doesn't mean that the, you will get a 24 month visa. The maximum length visa you will get is 12 months. After 12 months, if you want to extend and your employer is willing to extend your placement, you have to go back to your home country and you can apply for another 12-month visa. But you will never be given a full 24-month visa. So it will be two, uh, two visas of 12 months each. So just remember that. Now, in contrast to the Tier 2, where the employer is required to be able to sponsor you, as I said earlier, in the Tier 5, you don't need an employer to hold any sponsorship license because you will be using an overarching body like us, uh, and we are the ones who will sponsor you. So we will be your sponsor. At the moment, who is your sponsor? The university, that's correct. So if you do anything wrong, it's the university that gets blamed. So when, if you're under tier five, if you do something wrong, it'll be my neck on the line uh, because we are your sponsors. So the beauty about this for the employers are that is, like I said earlier, those who don't have the funds to have their own uh, tier two license or if they're offering you a position that doesn't fit tier two requirement, they can use our services as a third party and we will be your sponsor. We will of course have a, it's sort of like a three-way relationship between us, your employer, um, and you. So we are your sponsors, but we sponsor you to be able to legally work for your employer. Any questions on that? Yes. Yeah, once I, for example, I get this 12 month uh, visa, mm -hmm. and uh, you said I can um, yeah, uh, get another 12 months That's from this company. Can I do it for another company? Or yes, you can do it for another company as well. It doesn't have to be the same employer. So yeah. you can move to another employer. Mm -hmm. What you can't do is when you're during that 12 month, you can't leave that employer yes. and decide to change yes. someone else because you can only work for the employer whose name is on the certificate of sponsorship. And you're given a certificate of sponsorship based that you will be working on that for that particular employer. Okay? All right, so the next slide. I can talk about who do we work with. So we work with students who are here in the UK and they want to switch from tier four to tier five. Do you understand what switching means? Yes, who said yes? Okay. And it means you, you don't go back to your country and apply from there, but rather you, like you are on the tier four and you switching smoothly to tier five. Fantastic, yes, so tier, switching means when you change visa categories without leaving the UK. Now, if you went back to your home country and applied for a tier five visa from there, that's not a switch. Now, something you should probably note down the criteria for switch. As Helen kindly pointed out earlier, the, the, there's two things that you need to bear in mind. First, the role that's offered to you must be directly related to what you're studying on your current tier four visa. So if you're studying a marketing course, then you must find a job within marketing. And second, you must have successfully completed that degree that you hit on your tier four visa and possess evidence of it. So either your degree certificate or a confirmation of award from the university confirming that you've successfully cleared all your exams um, and you're simply waiting for the degree to be awarded. Now, what happens if, let's say you studied marketing, but you got a job within, say, sales? Can you apply for the visa? Yeah. Yes? Where will you be able to apply for the visa from? Fantastic. Yes, so if your job is not related to what you've studied, then it doesn't mean you cannot apply for the Tier 5 GAE visa. All it means is that you have to go back home and apply for the visa from your home country. Also, I usually do advise students to go back home and apply for the visa just because it's much quicker. So if you apply from outside of UK, the processing times are between 10 and 15 days. Whereas if you apply in the UK, they are from anything between five to eight weeks. So you do have to remember that. So I do suggest students go back home, say hi to your family, spend time with your loved ones, because then for the next 12 months you'll be working and slogging here. 
So uh, better to go back home. But those of you who don't want to go back home uh, and are eligible to switch, you possess your degree certificate or your confirmation of award and have found a job that's directly related, then you can apply for the visa from here. But just remember that the visa processing times are between five and eight weeks in the UK. Okay, also we work with students who are outside of the UK. So let's say you graduated next, uh, next year um, and you weren't able to find an internship before your visa expired. Um, you can then go back home and still apply for this visa as long as you apply for this visa within the three years from your graduation date. So you have up to three years to apply for this program from when you graduate. Now this clause is specific to access tier five. Um, other schemes like UNAC or GTI, they might have a different restriction. Each scheme is different and unique in its own way. As Helen pointed out earlier, have a look at each scheme's eligibility criteria and see which one applies to you and is most suitable to you and apply to that scheme. If you want to apply under our scheme, then you have to have graduated within the last three years um, if you want to apply through us. Um, we also work with students who are not here in the UK and have not studied in the UK. So if you have friends and family, your brothers, sisters who are studying back home, they don't have to be a UK graduate in order to apply for this visa. They too can apply for this as long as they have an internship offer with a UK based employer and the employer to have, is happy to use our services. Finally, we also work directly with law firms and immigration advisors who advise their clients to come and use our services and we will sponsor them. So many a times, let's say, so one of the biggest companies that we work with is Facebook. We do about 70 candidates for Facebook each year. Now, so we work with their lawyers, we don't work directly with them. So Facebook will identify nationals that they want to offer internships to and then their lawyers get in touch with us and we support them and sponsor them for the duration they're working with Facebook. Okay, now here is a list of some of the clients that we work with. So as I said, Facebook, we work with GWT, we work with Google, we work with a lot of football and rugby clubs, so Manchester City, Manchester United, Science Museum, Sony, uh, we work with fashion houses like Mulberry and Burberry, Alexander McQueen, the girls would probably be interested in that. Um, JP Morgan, we do their graduate training program. Um, I've talked about IEAs, that institute where the lady I talked about, Kate Andrews, who was in question time last week, um, Ford, Prison, so big, lots of big companies. Now the reason I put out the names of these employers over here is A, A of course I have permission to share their details, uh, but also these are the brands that you identify with. If I put up, uh, you know, this is not to say that we don't work with any startups or small companies, but if I put the names of the startups and small companies, you've probably never heard of them. So that's why I put out all these uh, big companies over here. Now, this is the section you probably want to pay the attention because this is the eligibility criteria. The maximum length of the placement is 12 months at a time. So the minimum length would be four weeks and the maximum of 12 months. After 12 months, you have to go back home. You cannot extend in the UK. And if you want to come back, then you must have another certificate of sponsorship and you're allowed to come back for a maximum of another 12 months. You can only use this visa twice, so after you've used two periods of 12 months, you're not allowed to use this visa route again. The minimum qualification uh, required is that, uh, is that of an undergraduate enrolled at an ARIC listed institution. This is an ARIC listed institution, so you guys don't have to worry about it. As long as you successfully graduate from here, you will be eligible to apply for the program. The candidate must have completed their last education no longer than three years ago. I already covered this point earlier. So yes, you have up to three years from when you finish your education here to be able to apply for this visa. Um, if you decide to do, a, let's say, a master's after you've done your bachelor's, then again, you have three years from when you complete your master's program to uh, take advantage again of the program. The placement that's offered to you must be supernumerary. That is, do you know what supernumerary means? Okay, so supernumerary means it should be a position which is outside of the regular staffing requirements 
of a business. So let's say it takes five people to run a business successfully. A supernumerary position will be one which is outside of these five people. So it will be a sixth position that's created for you and it should be a learning or an internship or training position. It cannot be a permanent role. As long as it's a temporary role uh, and it's a training role or a, you know like a work experience internship program, then that would be classed as a supernumerary position. Also, the placement must be full time. So the minimum hours you need to work is 35 hours per week. Uh, we do not sponsor part-time roles or unpaid or voluntary roles. BUNAC, the other scheme that Helen talked about, they do part-time, uh, they do sponsor part-time roles and unpaid and voluntary roles, whereas our scheme, Access Tier 5, doesn't support unpaid roles. So you would have to work minimum 35 hours per week a maximum of 48, and you also need to be paid. So if you're based in London, if the position is London-based, you have to be paid at least 15,000 per annum. If you're based outside of London, the national minimum wage will suffice. Any questions regarding these first five points? Okay, yes. Uh, is it possible that uh, someone uh, just set up uh, his own business? In no, America? you can't, no. You have to undertake an internship with a UK employer. Yes. What if I am under the T4, uh, my course is placement. It mm -hmm. means I have a eligible for trial month week placement. Okay. So do I need to, uh, it means after my trial month placement, I need to switch to the T5? Well, you can work, if, you, if your course requires you to do a placement, then yeah. your visa will cover that. This is outside, when you finish your education, you've done your work placement within your education, yeah. it's outside of that. So it's the additional period. It's when you want to stay here after your tier four visa expires. Most student visas finish uh, by the end of January because courses finish in September. So I think your visas would probably finish by the end of January, early February. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 So this is after you, your visa expires because you have these four months. So when you finish your courses in September, you have four months to look for a job or start working full time because you're allowed to work full time outside of your term time. I would suggest take advantage of this four months that you get. Once those four months are over, then apply for the tier five to maximize the time in the UK. Yes. Yeah, national minimum wage, not the national living wage. The national minimum wage, yes. And what is that now? Uh, I think it's approximately 12,500. Just about that, yeah, something around that. For, 30, for 35 hours. Okay. So for 35 hours, yes. Okay. Everyone's above 18? Yeah. Yes? Okay, fantastic. So we don't need to worry about this point. Any work that the candidate undertakes must be of a skill level, NBQ and QF level three. I talked about this earlier. There's a skill level attached to each position. As long as the position is NBQ level three or above, you can apply for tier five. What NBQ level does it have to be for tier two? Six. Perfect, okay, good. So you are paying attention. <laughs> Um, the employer must have financial and personal resources to be able to support you throughout the placement. So when you find an uh, employer that's willing to offer you the placement, you will introduce your employer to us. We will undertake certain checks uh, both on you uh, and the employer as well. We want to make sure that the employer is in the financial and personal capacity to be able to support you. So by that what we mean we will make sure that you will probably look at their bank statements or their latest accounts to see that they can support you and pay you for the work that you're doing. As your sponsor, we take our responsibility very, very seriously. We don't want a situation where we sponsor an individual and they're being taken advantage of. I mean, you see these articles in the press all the time where migrants weren't, weren't paid and you know they were continuing to work because they wanted to stay here in the UK. And as your sponsor, if there's a situation like that occurs, you do let us know and we get back, we take that very seriously and we, we handle your employer then. Um, so we will we want to avoid a situation like that. That's why we ensure that we undertake certain checks on your employer to ensure that they are going to pay you and support you uh, both financially and personally. 
Uh, finally, the employer must be a UK registered company, so they must have trading presence in the UK. They could be a registered company, charity, government department, LLP. Um, as long as they're trading here in the UK, they can provide evidence that they're trading in the UK. You can apply to work for them. Like I said, they don't need to have a sponsorship license, they just need to be trading in the UK. Now, there are four sectors that we don't work within uh, that is hospitality. Anybody studying hospitality? Right, so we don't support hospitality roles. Um, and I don't think any other overarching body supports hospitality either. Uh, the other two are agriculture and care. By care, we, were, we mean working essentially with say, sort of like old age homes or any disability. Uh, we don't work within these three sectors. Outside of this, we support about 45 different sectors that we support um, and sponsor individuals for. But these three sectors were unable to sponsor. But again, this is restricted to access tier five. If you are working within this sector, uh, perhaps try other overarching bodies who might be able to sponsor you. That's that, that is the eligibility criteria. Any questions regarding that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you keep mentioning overarching bodies like you're, mm -hmm. is there a listing of these overarching bodies? Yes, so Helen pointed that out in the presentation. It's the list of government authorized That's exchange the sponsors. Website. Yes, yeah, the there are essentially four sponsors within within the particular G, uh, GAE scheme, which is GTI, BUNAC, Fragomen, and ISEC, which is which runs the Access Tier 5 program. Right. Uh, someone else, yes. Yeah. If, if I'm having some work experience back in my home country, like, okay. About two or three years, and then I'm doing masters. Here. Okay. I still eligible for. So once you complete your masters, you will have three years from when you completed your masters to apply for this program. Yeah. So you can go back home after your bachelor's, maybe work there for a year or two, then come back and do your masters. No, I mean to say, I have experience before doing my masters. Yeah, that's fine. Still. That is yeah. As long as you're studying here in the UK, you can apply for the program for up to three years. Yeah. Yes. As far as I understand, my Tier 5 is not like Tier 4 where you lose some points if you move back or if you're not applying from the UK. No, it has no significance, it has nothing. So it doesn't make a difference whether you apply for the visa from the UK or you go back home and apply. Like I said, most of the students do go back home and they apply for the visa because then they're going to be stuck here for 12 months during the internship. So I do suggest the students do go back home and it's much quicker to apply from that. Anything else? Yes. Is it possible to switch it from tier one graduate from tier one visa to tier five? No, you can't switch. You'll have to go back home and apply for the visa from outside. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, if you go back home and apply, mm -hmm. are there cases that were rejected? You know, well, we are very proud to say that in the five years I've been running this program. Shh. Thank you. We've only ever had two refusals, and just one application was refused because the individual, it wasn't a genuine application, and the second one was refused because the individual forgot to send their degree certificate. When they sent their degree certificate to home office, the application was overturned. So we have a very high success rate. If we've taken your case on, it is 99.99999% certain you will get the visa. So we've sponsored, like I said, about two and a half thousand international students in the last five years, and only two applications have ever been refused. So if we're taking your case on, then yeah, you're probably gonna get the visa. Yes, did you have a question, or did you just do that? <laughs> but, okay, but can yes. I ask, at that time, the, the employee in the UK needs to be willing to recruit you first, right? Yes, you have to have an offer of internship first. What we don't do is we don't find an internship for you. So when you approach us, you must have at least a provisional offer. So even if it's not a confirmed offer, your employer must be willing to uh, you know, entertain the idea they're happy to offer you the internship. Now we don't charge a fee till the time we can guarantee you that we're happy to offer you a sponsorship. So let's say you found an internship with an employer, you submit all the documents to us, and the application wasn't successful. So just, if your application isn't successful with us, you don't pay any fees. The employer only pays the fees if the application is successful and we're happy to sponsor you. So that's how so you can apply multiple times. Let's say you apply with one company and that doesn't, is not successful. You can apply with using another company and hopefully that will be successful. So as long as you meet the eligibility criteria, uh, there is no reason why you shouldn't get the sponsorship letter from us. 
Anything else regarding the eligibility criteria? I'm going to talk about the process next. Okay. So how does the program work? Like I said, first thing, the employer and candidate must identify each other. So you must have at least a provisional offer uh, or an employer interested in offering you this position. When you have found the employer, get in touch with us or introduce your employer to us. We will then send them our initial assessment form, which they have to complete and return with three company documents and you need to send us three documents. Now those three documents are a copy of your passport, copy of your tier four visa or the resident permit that you have, and a copy of your degree certificate. If you're applying from the UK, then we need to have that degree certificate or a confirmation letter from the university. If you're applying from outside of UK, just an enrollment letter from the university or even a transcript will suffice. A degree certificate is not required. When we have these seven documents, we will take one working day to let you know whether or not you are successful. This is the biggest USP of Access Tier 5. One, of course, that we don't charge any fees to the students that we sponsor. And second, that we make a decision within one working day. Whereas other overarching bodies will take at least two weeks to make a decision and come back to you. So, but we will let you know in one day if you're eligible or not. Assuming that you're eligible, we then issue what is called our client and migrant care letters. Those are essentially our terms of sponsorship. A client being the employer, they will have to sign the client care letter, and you being the migrant, you will sign the migrant care letter. As soon as we have those two letters, you will issue your certificate of sponsorship in one working day if your employer has chosen express route, or five working days if your employer has chosen standard route. Then, once you have the certificate of sponsorship, you then apply for a visa yourself, either in the UK if you're eligible to switch, or from your home country if you're applying from there. Now, do you know what a certificate of sponsorship is? Yes. Yeah? You are so well. You should come and work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, so, sorry, what is it? Yeah. So, the certificate of sponsorship is uh, the document that actually proves that this company or organization sponsors your visa and it is responsible for you uh, while you're here in the UK. Absolutely. It's actually just a 13 digit number. Yeah. That's what it is. But without this 13 digit number, you cannot work in the UK. So if it's tier two, then the employer will issue you this 13 digit number. If it's tier five, we will issue you with this 13 digit number. At the moment, your sponsor is your university, so they must have issued you with a CAS. Yeah. When you work for an employer, it's a cause, a certificate of sponsorship. So that's the process. It's a very straightforward, quick process. Um, any questions regarding the process? Yes, no? Okay, uh, moving on to the fees. I'm sure everyone's inquisitive to find out what the fee structure is. The good thing about ISEC, the company that I work for, we are a student organization ourselves and a not-for-profit organization, so we don't charge any fees to the students that we sponsor. Yes, we do need to be paid, so our fees are paid by the employers. I think other overarching bodies like GTI and UNAC, they charge you, not the employers, but with us, it's the other way around. We don't charge the students. We give free immigration advice. Uh, we get involved in your negotiation process with your employers as well, um, and our services are absolutely free for you. So even if you don't use our services, if you need some sort of immigration advice, you're very welcome to give us a call, and we'll be happy to uh, answer any immigration-related questions that you have. You don't have to spend money going to a lawyer or an immigration advisor. We have an immigration department within the office, and one of my immigration officers will be happy to answer those questions. So regarding the fees, there is a registration fee of 600 pounds plus VAT, which the employer has to pay. That's for the first candidate that we sponsor for them. If it's an employer that we've already worked with, let's say it's Facebook or Google or any of the other employers that we work with, then they pay a reduced fee of 150 pounds plus VAT. So for the first candidate, it's 600 pounds. If it's the second candidate that you're using or it's a subse any subsequent candidates, then they pay a registration fee of 150 pounds. I'll just come to you. There's also a second fee, which is the actual cost of sponsorship, and that is based on the length of the sponsorship. So if it's a 12-month placement, if the employer is using 
uh, the express route of one working day, then they pay 1,200 plus VAT. If it's a standard route, then they pay 750 plus VAT. But both the fees, please bear in mind that this fees has to be paid by the employer. We will not accept any payments from the students that we sponsor. You do have to pay the fees, uh, but those will be your visa fees. They, have, they are not our fees. Those fees you'll pay directly to UKBI and they are as below. So you will have to pay the visa fee. If you're applying by post, it is 230 pounds. If you're applying by a premium route in the UK, which is one working day processing time, you will pay 730. But this fee you have to pay to home office, not to us. Also, you have to pay the immigration health surcharge. You probably pay that this year as well to be able to use NHS. That's at 200 pounds. So the bottom part is to be paid by you directly to UKBI, our fees are paid by our employer. Uh, questions? I saw some hands raising. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, um, if there are like two applications in your tennis, mm -hmm. how much would it be for you? So the, for the first applicant, it'll be 600, and the second applicant, it'll be 150. Yeah. So if it's a third applicant, it'll still be 150. Yeah. Only for the first candidate, because we have to do extra checks on the employer. So the, for the first uh, candidates, we charge more for the first candidate. Every subsequent candidate, they pay 150 plus tax. Yes. Uh, is this uh, dependent system? Yes, you can have dependents as well. So if you're looking to bring in a dependent, you're allowed to bring in a dependent, they can make an application on the back of your application. One thing to bear in mind if you're bringing a dependent is that for you have to save another £630 for a consecutive period of 90 days per dependent. Okay, so that's something you have to bear in mind. £630 per dependent. Sorry, 645 pounds, I apologize, not 630, 645 pounds per dependent. But uh, unlike other overarching bodies that don't provide sponsorship, uh, sorry, maintenance, we do support maintenance. So if you're applying for a certificate of sponsorship through us, you don't have to save the 945 pounds for 90 days. We will issue you with what it's called a maintenance letter. As long as you include this maintenance letter in your visa application, you don't have to show any bank statements or have to save any money. Does that make sense? It's a very big plus point, especially those who don't, I mean, I was a student and I definitely couldn't have saved 945 pounds for three months without having to borrow it from my parents. Um, so we do understand that and that's why any candidate that we sponsor, we issue them with a maintenance letter. However, if you are bringing a dependent, we will not certify maintenance for the dependent. You have to have savings for your dependent. For the main applicant, we'll be happy to issue with a maintenance letter. Any core questions regarding, yes? Um, do you have a list of companies um, who already have the candidates? Well, the, the, they're, they're in my slide. Those are the ones that I can share. Otherwise, for data protection, we don't really share without the permission. So the ones that are mentioned on my slides, you can all get a copy of the slides. Those are the employers you're more than welcome to uh, approach because they're already working with us and they don't have to pay the extra registration fee because they're already registered with us as well. So these are the ones. But you know, if you can work with any employer, like I said, it doesn't have to be restricted. So what I also do is um, I'm very happy to get involved in the negotiation process. So let's say you're starting to talk to an employer. Of course, I can explain the program better than you can. I do this every day. So if you want, book an appointment with me. I'll be very happy to speak to the employer over the phone, help them understand how the program works. Believe it or not, I get to ask this question every time I speak to a new employer. Is this legal? Why is it so simple? Why have I not heard about it? Are you sure you're legal? And then I have to direct them to the government website and show our name and say, look at this. Yes, we sponsor about 500 international students each year. We have an A-rated status. Um, so this is a very much legal program. It's just that it's not very publicized. I don't know why the government doesn't, you know, uh, publicize it as much, but I do as much talking as I can about this program. I speak at about 25 to 30 universities each year, twice a year. So I do about 60 sessions in this. I also write about it and talk, try and talk as much as I can to create awareness. So if you want my help or one of my team members to help you get this internship, do book an appointment. I am very busy, so you have to book an appointment with me. Um, and I'll be happy to explain to the employer how the program works and answer any questions that they have. Where can the, uh, the 
my details at the end of the presentation. Okay, any, any other questions before I move to the next? Yes. Is it dependent on how to work? Uh, the dependent will have the same rights as you do. So as you're allowed to work 40 hours, they will be allowed to work 40 hours as well. Well, they are allowed to uh, work with any company. With Sorry? Company. They can work with any other firm. Yes, yeah, they can work with any other company because they have the same rights as you do. Anything else? Yes. Is there any visa for uh, your own uh, business if you start? No, this is not. This you cannot. You cannot start your own business under this. It has. You can only have time to take an internship or a work experience program. Then you have to look at alternative routes if you want to set up a business. I mean, is there, there, are there are different routes that you can undertake. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the knowledge about those, so I won't delve into that. We'll be talking about those and uh, visas for self-employment in a future presentation. Okay. So for self-employment, we'll talk about it in the next presentation. Uh, anybody else? Any questions? Okay, I'll move on to the next slide. So the benefits for the students, as I said, we don't charge any fees to the students. Our services are free, like I said, and I always say this again and again, don't hesitate to give us a call. You're not going to be charged any fees at all. Your employer only pays the fees if you're successful, and we're happy to issue with a certificate of sponsorship. Uh, we are an A-rated sponsor. I already covered this point, so we're happy to certify any maintenance, which means, as I said earlier, you don't have to save 945 pounds. We will issue you with a maintenance letter. As long as you include this maintenance letter in your visa application to Home Office, you don't need to uh, show any bank statements. Unless, of course, you're applying for a dependent. Individuals in the UK can switch from Tier 4 to Tier 5. Let's see who is paying attention. Except for you, I'm not going to have to answer this question. I want to see someone from this side. Can someone tell me the two points required to switch? Yeah, it must be related to the present cost you are undertaking. Fantastic, yes, it must be related to what you've studied. This side. Uh, second point? Successfully have completed your education. Yes, fantastic. You have to have successfully completed your education. And you might, it's, it's not just that you have successfully completed, you have to have evidence of it. So either a degree certificate or a letter from the university confirming that you have successfully completed your course. Okay, good. Um, there is no cooling off period when applying or uh, moving to a different category. Do you know I talked about those two case studies, the two candidates who moved on to tier two. One of the biggest advantages is that there is no cooling off period. Do you understand what a cooling off period means? Mm -hmm. Cooling off period is a restriction that's applied. So once you're in a certain category, you can't come back into the UK for X amount of time. For example, there is a visa category called the tier two ICT, which is the intra-company transfer. If you come to the UK on a tier two ICT visa, once your visa is completed, you're not allowed to come back into the UK for 12 months. But the beauty about tier five is if you finish your tier five visa and your employer has offered you a permanent position under tier two, all you have to do is go back home, get the visa, you, and come straight back in. And it can take as little as three days if you take premium processing and a maximum of about three weeks to get the tier two visa. So you'll only be leaving the UK for a very short period of time. And that, and those who want to uh, you know, stay here indefinitely, this time does constitute, the tier five time, does constitute towards the 10 years to apply for indefinite leave to remain. So another something to bear in mind. Yes, did you have a question? Yes, so this could be done only with the uh, company that sponsored this goal that you had the internship with. You have the internship way, then maybe, the, and they're willing to offer you a tier two. But yes, of course, if another employer offers you a tier two sponsorship, you just have to go back home and come back under the tier two visa. So is there any more time to spend on the tier five? For example, let's say if someone is starting with tier five and mm -hmm. find a job and super lucky within a month. Yeah, so then you just, you let us know, we withdraw your sponsorship under tier five, you go back home, and then you apply for a tier two visa and come straight back in. So they can't switch it from? You can't switch from tier five to tier two. You have to go back home. Yeah? I know it would be so much better if you could do that, but immigration rules yeah, prohibit you from doing that. Uh, they started switching as well only in 2013, so up until that you couldn't switch either. So, But that's a big advantage now that you don't have to leave if you can't find a job that's related to what you've studied. Um, so the next slide is just a little bit of it's statistics that we have from last year, the sponsorships that we did in the year from 1st January 2016 to 31st January 2016, this is just access tier 5 data, I work, the company that I work for is ISAC, 
they do 150 candidates themselves and we do 350. So we all together we sponsor about 500, but relate, data relating to access tier 5, we sponsored 351 candidates. Out of those, uh, 88 candidates came from China, followed by 53 from US, uh, 36 from India, 30 from Malaysia, 13 from Russia, and the rest were made of, of the remaining, what, 49 countries. So we sponsored about 50 nationals from 54 different countries. As long as you're outside the EEA, you're a uh, national uh, from outside of the EU, then you can apply for this visa program. Well, in two years' time, probably EU nationals would also have to apply for this. Um, so that's that. Um, also, we 207 internationals, out of these 351 students, 207 of those students were studying here in the UK at UK universities across 62 different UK universities. And from this 207, 98 students switched from tier four to tier five. The remaining went back home and applied for the visa from their home country. Whether that was a personal decision or whether they didn't meet the eligibility criteria to switch, I don't know. But 98 students applied to switch from tier four to tier five outside um, from the 207 who studied here in the UK. Uh, 39 of those students then applied for a second year extension and they applied for a second 12 month visa. So not many students have applied for a second 12 month visa. They probably were offered a tier two visa after that or they wanted to go back and work in a different country. So only 39 students applied for extensions. And as I said earlier, we sponsor students across 43 different sectors. The three sectors that we don't operate in are hospitality, agriculture, and care. Outside of that, there are 43 sectors that we support. Any questions? Okay, so if you want to find out more, these are some of the articles that were published recently that I've written about. Um, again, you'll, have, you'll get a copy of these slides from Helen, and so you can look at them later. Um, Oh, there's more. I'm obviously a big pro on international students. I don't think the government should be counting students uh, in the net migration numbers as well. Um, and if they did do that, they'd easily bring down the immigration numbers. But I wish I was the prime minister. Uh, <laughs> but um, since I'm not, um, but I definitely do strongly believe that international students, and I think the most public as well. I mean, there was a vote uh, in uh, 20. 15, where I think about 65% of the British public believed that international students contribute a lot to the UK economy, which I 100% stick by. So I don't understand the government's stance on, uh, you know, including students in the net migration number. Yes. Home minister would be better. Uh, yes, <laughs> I think I love doing what I do, so maybe I, I'm probably not very politically uh, inclined, but I love doing so. I, I do my bit by being able to help you guys, you know, because like I said, I came, like you guys, I had dreams uh, and ambitions to come here and work and study here and stay here and make a life for myself. And I love what I do and I have a lot of passion for it because I've been through those struggles and I really understand. Uh, you know, how much it means to us to be able to stay here and work and get this ever so valuable UK experience. Um, I got my indefinite leave to remain uh, a year and a half ago, uh, and I was the happiest girl in the planet when I got my, after my 10 years in the UK, I applied for my ILR, and next month I'll be applying for my passport. So yeah, I, this is why I set up this program five years ago, because I want to help as many international students as I can who have the same dreams and ambitions like I did 10 years ago. So yeah, I'm doing my bit. <laughs> um, if you want to find out more about this scheme, um, and if anyone says, is this scheme legal, legitimate, or is it a con, direct them to the government website. This is the government link that you can direct them to. Uh, and they can find out more themselves that this is a valid program. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, this is my direct number and direct email address, so feel free to contact me. I'm also quite active on social media. If I know of a position that any of my employers are advertising, I will always tweet or tweet about it. Um, if you follow me or access tier five, then you will have, you'll get that information. Um, with that, I think I will end my session. If you have any questions, please let me know. But just don't go yet, because I, like I said, I'm very active on my social media. So I always like to take a picture, and I will post that on my social media profile. Thank you.
Okay, and this side as well. Great, thank you so much. Yes. That's why I don't need to react. I like to take the students. But yeah, do you have any questions? Yes. So 